Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team for a very special midweek episode uh, with our very special guest. This is the Pulse of the Van Base, the third time that we're doing this year for a year-end wrap-up with our good friend from Section 124, Ant Larger. All right, the 2023 season is mercifully at its end, and we've always felt that before you can move forward, you should look back first and do a self-assessment. With us today to help us with that and provide his contribution to the pulse of the fan base is our special guest, one of our the very rare few who can personally attest to the massive difference it makes that we record this show more than 24 hours after the game on Monday night and not Sunday <laughs> night. Uh, he sees us in uh, in our our section in 124. This is our buddy Ant. Uh, so he sits with us just about every week um, that we're home, and he sees us act like maniacs in the stands, and then hangs out with us, watches us uh, on Tuesday mornings with the rest of you guys, much more calm than we are in the stands. I, I got a very important question before we start the show <laughs> off altogether. What is it like to sit next to geniuses such as Grump and myself on a weekly basis for how many years? I mean, do you feel enlightened? Do you feel like the hand of God is next to you? Or you're just like, there's these two schmucks who sit next to me who are just very annoying. And I wish they get thrown out by security. No, just lucky, to be honest with you, man. Um, <laughs> when we sat on the opposite side of the stadium, my former seat uh, seat partner, seat neighbor, if you will, was Pete Davidson before he was famous. And I feel like uh, I somehow upgraded from that. So um, just uh, thanks for having me on, guys. And, uh, it's it's uh, great sitting next to some fans who are as passionate as I am. I have to say that. <laughs> I, I am, first of all... Uh, I like to think I'm funnier than Pete Davidson. Um, <laughs> second of all, uh, that that is a huge compliment. That is that's amazing. I, I actually didn't know that. Did you ever tell us that? Davidson, I don't think I've ever told you that. No. <laughs> I've often wondered how Pete da- Davidson and the Grump get so many girls as they do. But uh... <laughs> him, him, it's the tattoos. Me, it's the the brain. Really, right? I got the mustache. I think it's a dome. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, I am really excited to have you on here. So we, I think that we're really lucky, right? Um, we don't officially sit next to each other. There are seats between us that for people who never show up. We're often yeah. visitor fans, so we just kind of scoot over and sit next to you. Because honestly, it's it's really refreshing. You know, you sit in our section. You, I, I you are in the one percent of that section that really knows what's going on. Um, from Sunday to Sunday, but also what's going on on the field. You know, you you and I both know like really rare corners of rules where we're like the mm-hmm. only ones screaming about things in the stands. I I'm really and you're a big talking giants listener too. Like you're you're a really good dude. We're we're I'm happy to have you on here. But just in general, if we didn't have a yeah. show, it's awesome that we sit right next to you. Really truly. Um. So I'm. Uh, this that. is gonna be a this is gonna be a fun show because you know what you're talking about and stuff. So, um. Let's start with this. I'm just going to let you talk. Uh, I'll let you vent. Look, the, the season clearly didn't go well, right? Uh, got punched in the mouth opening day. Took two quarters to wake the hell up in Arizona. Lost Barkley due to injury. And then a short turnaround against the NFL best San Francisco. Laid a rotten egg on Monday night against Seattle. Uh, and then had to face high-powered Miami. I, I think it's fair to say that at that point of the season, it had already fallen fully out of control. Um, so talk to me about this year. Tell me how you feel, what you think. Just... Give me your thoughts. It sucked, man. It sucked. I had the highest expectations that I've had of a giant season for for quite some time going into the season. And I think that was really collective uh, around the whole fan base. I don't think that was just myself. I was very optimistic coming off of last season. Um, And then, like you said, very, very, very quickly, things just kind of collapsed. Um, It really um, that John Michael Schmidt's bad snap that led to the long field goal attempt that led to the blocked kick that led to Thomas getting hurt and really everything kind of just fell apart from there. It was a brutally tough schedule to start the season, which definitely didn't help matters, you know, sans the Cardinals game, of course, the pretty bad team there. But um, I don't really know how much of a difference it would have made if they'd had an easier schedule to start the year with with just everything that could have gone wrong it seemed went wrong and you know I'm, I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit later on in the podcast but the fact that there wasn't a complete collapse at any point does give me hope for the future but you know just for looking back first 
it just really did feel like everything that could have possibly gone wrong to start the season did, um, you know, the, the great comeback in Arizona, but being down 20 to nothing at the half and then having to turn around four nights later, play San Francisco. And, uh, yeah, that Seattle game was, was really probably one of the worst games that I've ever personally been to. And, uh, it really, it felt like everything was over after that Seattle game for me. It's interesting that you think that Seattle game was the worst. You didn't think so. I would say I'm not even sure which Dallas game is worse. Uh, you know, one was a shutout. We got punched in the face, but also you lose your starting left tackle immediately. That that's that's a little bit more excusable. You know, coming out of the off season, it's pretty. Uh, it's not uncommon for good teams to be rusty and lay an egg right away and hot take Monday, the first Monday, everyone says Tom Brady and the Patriots are the worst team in the NFL. This is it for them. <laughs> and then they win the Super Bowl. So like, on the one hand, there is that. But then you know that second Dallas game, we now know is the kind of the apex, the genesis of the Wink Martindale, Brian Dable split. Um, and all in all, it was just absolute garbage. You, you had Tommy DeVito in his first career start against probably the most ferocious defense in the end. I don't know if it's the best, but certainly the scariest looking uh, to be in a bad pocket the for. The scariest if you're an you know, inexperienced, not good quarterback. With, with, with nothing protecting you. And, and, yeah. and then you had a, a defense that was just that led up something like 650 yards. It was like a historic day in Cowboys history. I'm not kidding about that either. I think that statistically is true. I'm not even sure which Cowboys game is worse. It's interesting to me that you think Seattle was that tipping point for you. Is it just the point in the season? For me, honestly, it was because I thought that we could beat Seattle. Going into the first Dallas game, yes, I did think that we could win that game, but you still felt like Dallas was a better team than we were. I did at least. Going into that Seattle game, even coming off of the loss to San Francisco, we played okay in that San Francisco game. There were good things out of that game. And you just felt like Seattle at home to get to 2-2, two and two, a game that you desperately needed knowing that Miami and Buffalo on the road were coming up. For them to lay that egg in that game, that really, for me, was, was the death sentence of the season. Um, just everything about that game was terrible. The defense actually was no, was not terrible, which was a common theme for most of the season. They were not terrible, but not amazing. But I mean, three points against that Seattle defense, that, that pick six, uh, it, it, that just felt like the death sentence for me. Um, I, I remember vividly, I think it was late second quarter. And I know Danny was under pressure pretty much the whole game immediately, but there was one play where he rolled out to his right. And Wandale was just running along the sideline, actually not running along the sideline, just standing along the sideline, jumping up and down, waving his arms, and uh, Danny just threw it away. And that, to me, kind of summed up the whole, that's it, we got nothing here. And um, obviously, it was kind of downhill from there. Yeah, see, for me, the low point, uh, to me, it's always when, you know, the doctor comes in and says, that's it, you're a terminal case, you're done. That's always the low point for me. And to me, the second Daniel Jones went down and we were doing the, the live stream with uh, with Bobby and Justin, you know, and we, we saw it in front of us and we both the four of us looked at each other like, you know, that's not only the end of this season, but that could be a whole shift on what's happening with this program going forward. Now, all of a sudden before that, you know, it's like, OK, well, this is kind of a lost season. You know, well, next year they'll bounce back. Now, all of a sudden, the conversation became. This team may not win another game this year. We may have an opportunity to get a whole new quarterback. This might be, you know, an extension of the rebuild. It may take a little longer because of that. And everything changed. And to me, that's the low point of this because it seemed like all the momentum we had from last year. And I know I and I said this on last year's show, last week's show, massive asterisk for this year. What what, what happened? I can't. I can't judge the coaches. I can't judge anything because we lost so many people. But when that second, when Daniel Jones went down, it was like, you know, the stability we thought we had at the quarterback position, the stability, a lot of things all of a sudden is up in the air. And that was a very sick feeling for me. And it was just like, I just want to fast forward to basically this past Monday morning when this season is over. And I don't like wasting half a season not caring anymore, but it really, I just, Wanted it to be over. That, to me, is the low point. That was a very sick feeling. Yeah, I, 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 so I think I agree with you, but it's, 
I can see both sides here. So, um, y- you know, the difference is for me with the Raiders game, I think part of it was because we were going to the live event. You know, you, you go there and you're hoping to see something, right? And, and you had a you had a weak team. You know, I, I don't care what the stats say about an interim head coach's first game, whatever. If they're a bad team, you know, it, there, there's good teams that That's fire random. head coaches in midseason and then there's bad teams that do it. You, you had Aiden O'Connell and, you know, uh, an interim head coach. It's not just about the, the head coach thing. Um, so y- you look at it and you had – prior to that, you, you escape with a win with Tyrod Taylor against the Commanders, which remember, even last year we went – uh, 1-0 and 1 against the Commanders. So it's not like beating them is ever a sure thing for us. Um, y- you get surprised. You almost walked away with a victory against a very good Jets defense with Tommy DeVito at quarterback. A very that should have been a win, but you know, I I don't know about you. I was feeling fairly hopeless walking into that game. I I didn't have a ton of confidence. I was just kind of happy it was Halloween and I don't know. I was just drunk. But um, leaving that game, it was like, you know what? I'm surprised that we hung around. You know, we, we, you know, we didn't do great, obviously, but it was a little bit better than I thought. And you think that with Daniel Jones coming back that next week, that it's like, wow, you, maybe this isn't as bad as we thought. Like, if he can come back and he can be healthy, then, you know, we beat this Raiders team. Who knows? Mathematically, nothing's happened yet. Uh, but then he goes out there, and it's not just forget the ACL. Remember his first like three throws were like air oh. mail, bad. It was like something was noodle awesome. noodle arm, and like I have serious concerns about his neck and arm strength going forward. Uh, I mean, uh, it is indisputable that his movement skills are a huge part of his game, and coming back from an ACL is going to do all kinds of things. It, it's that to me was the lowest point because before Daniel Jones looked that went down, I was already really concerned from what I had seen. And not only did we lose that game, it, we looked awful in it. That was an un- we, that game, we were playing on our phones on a live stream at a certain point during that game. That was bad. So I mean, I, I think I agree with your low point. That's how bad it was. We were talking about Melissa awesome. Stark and yeah. <laughs> Um, but I mean, but, but before that game, though, we never really gave it more than two seconds that, you know, Daniel Jones is not the future. And that to me, that's that line where, you know, up until that point, it's like, all right, he's injured again. He hasn't played that well this year. He looked awful before the injury. But those are like kind of superficial things. But all of a sudden it instantly became, you know, we just invested in a guy who may not be our quarterback in 2025. And that is that was as much of a gut punch to me as, you know, that cowboy game, that Andrew Thomas injury, and all that stuff in the very beginning. Yeah, no, because it, it seems like you're starting over again. It does feel like that, and and that's never a good place to be. I was so desensitized going into that Vegas game from the Jets game because I mean I think the ESPN stats said that you had a 99.7 percent chance of winning that game before Gano missed the field goal, and then you know. Thomas McGahee, so glad that he's finally gone. Uh, Giants fans, you might know me as the fire Thomas McGahee guy. Um, That's just what I would always (laughs) scream during games. Um, So he's finally gone. But no, you know, missing the kick and then them finding a way to lose that game. I was so desensitized. That was the only week of probably the year that I did not listen to any Giants media, any Giants podcasts after a game. I'm sorry, guys. I skipped your podcast that week. I skipped talking Giants that week. I skipped Cut the line. You don't need this guy. (laughs) I'm too (laughs) honest here, but I was so desensitized going into that. And then, like you said, just Daniel going down, such a gut punch. And it's it's only fair to question moving forward. That's two neck injuries and and a torn knee. Like you said, uh, his legs are such a big part of his game. I don't know that he's a good enough passer to not, you know, have the the legs that he has had and still be a very successful quarterback. I think it's very fair to question that. I got two points. One, we lost one of the worst games in NFL history to the team that we shared the building with. And neither, uh, none of the three of us had that as the low point of the season. That's one <laughs> thing. <laughs> and the second thing is, you know, with that injury, that's not a just a 2023 problem. The starting quarterback on week one of next year is most likely, if not definitely, not on this roster right now. So mm-hmm. this is a, a hangover that's going to affect the beginning of next year. And if Daniel Jones is not ready to play week one or week two or week four, you know, what kind of hole are we going to be digging ourselves getting into, you know, to salvage next year? I mean, I know it's morbid thoughts, but 
it's going to be rattling around in my brain for the next several months. And that's fair because I don't think I'd, I'd be lying if I said I knew the free agent quarterback class, but I don't think there's ever such thing as a good free agent quarterback class. The good quarterbacks really tend to not hit free agency for a reason. Um, so, well, and, I, and and it's not like they can invest more money. They they still owe Jones so much money next year. I, you know. Well, realistically, you have a quarterback who's going to make forty something million dollars next year as one quarterback. There's a potential that we may draft his replacement. So that's that's another quarterback. So the free agent, I don't care who the free agent class is necessarily for all the starters out there. It's like I need a stopgap guy. Mm -hmm. I need a guy who can prepare in July and prepare in August to play in September and then hopefully be gone off the roster by October 1st. That's even harder to find than saying, oh, well, you know, Derek Carr is out there or, you know, Jameis Winston. And by the way, if Jameis Winston is on this roster next year, I'm quitting this show and I might just quit sports. So I was I was about to name drop Jameis Winston, and then I remembered he was a Florida State guy, and I bit my tongue. So, yeah. That's not even like the half the reason he hates him. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's not even his top ten. Uh, I forget the hell I was going to say there. Um, but let's stick let's stick with the offense for this year. Um, look, my assessment. I think it's a general consensus, though. Uh, the offensive line probably accounts for something like seventy-five percent of the blame for this year for being a disaster. Um, obviously, I don't think you can absolve Daniel Jones. Uh, like you said, there were definitely moments that you can clip that that are him missing guys, him panicking, you know, not pulling the trigger downfield. There, there is definitely something to the fact that Tyrod is able to throw down the field. Even Tommy DeVito is able to throw down the field and, and make big plays. And for some reason, Daniel Jones is not seeing that. I, I don't know, you know, where to percentage blame that though, because it's difficult to say how much. <laughs> Dealing with the offensive line, it's really difficult to say how much of the percentage is really his fault. But it is not uh, – I don't think it's a hot take at all to say that this offensive line was one of the worst ones I've ever seen. Um, Bobby Johnson re- uh, received the brunt of the uh, blame, I think, at year's end. He's out now. Um, I-, I think probably all three of us could do like a Ninja Turtles like group high five about that. But – I mean, missing a coach is still missing a coach. I mean, okay, we have identified a problem. We haven't fixed it yet. Firing somebody doesn't fix anything. Um, just talk to me about the offense. Is it just the O-line? Is it O-line DJ? Do you have issues with the running back position, tight ends, wide receivers? The, the scheme? The Yeah, so just talk to me about the offense this year. What are your thoughts? I think it's everything. I think that the line is a, a huge, huge portion of it because – at the beginning of the year, it was not even a little bit functional, uh, especially once Thomas went down. It was it was not even functional. And the line did it never became good, but it became at least functional towards the end of the season. And I think that helped make Tyrod and Tommy DeVito, quite frankly, help Tommy DeVito look like a capable NFL quarterback at times, which I don't think that Tommy DeVito is that. But, it you know, the, the line was good enough that it made him look like a functional NFL quarterback, especially in that maybe that Green Bay game uh, where he really did play pretty well. Um, this is maybe a little bit of a controversial topic. I think that Kafka deserves credit for that. Um, I, I think that to make that guy look like a you know functional NFL quarterback, that he deserves some credit for that. And I think that uh, Shea Tierney deserves some credit for that. And I think that Brian Dable deserves some credit for that as well. Um, the offense, it, 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 it was a disaster, right? We, we know that. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, the offense was good this year because I'd be lying to you guys and everyone that's listening. Uh, the offense was awful this year, and it's the reason that they lost most of the games that they lost. But the fact that it never became a Jake Fromm quarterback sneak from the your own two-yard line in the third quarter of a game situation with Tommy DeVito, I think speaks highly of Dable, of Kafka, of Tierney, of those guys. And it's part of the reason that I do want Kafka back. Um, I think that the line at the beginning of the year was so much of the issue and you, you don't have a, a true wide receiver one, right? I love Darius Slayton. I, I will always love Darius Slayton. As far as I'm concerned, Darius Slayton can be a giant for life. I'm good with that. He'd be a heck of a third receiver. He should not be your wide receiver one. And I, I know going into the year, Waller was the wide receiver one, if you will, even though he's a tight end, um, obviously that, that didn't work out. Uh, cause you can't bank on Darren Waller being healthy for, for 17 games. Unfortunately, I think that he played well when he was out there. And I think that he's getting a lot of, a lot of unjustified disdain 
because he wasn't healthy and because he wasn't dominant. I mean, I don't think you could have realistically expected 17 games from him. Um, but the line just makes up so much of it. You know, it really does. It, there was no time. It's not even like it was a bad line or it was not a bad line. It was a God awful line because I don't believe that you need a great line to succeed in the NFL. I think that with the right quarterback and with the right weapons, you can have a very average line and still have an explosive offense. And we were not even close to an average line. It was brutal. I mean, we have Saquon Barkley, who is pretty much a non-factor. And Grump has said repeatedly, you can see what he does when he has the slightest hole. But the problem is we never saw that. So pass blocking, run blocking, that was the problem. I mean, that's the biggest issue. I mean, we are still in a rebuild. We even said it last year. We're still rebuilding. You can't build, you can't solve every problem in one off season or even two off seasons. And unfortunately, the things that bit us the most were the issues that we haven't gotten around to doing. And we even tried to address, I mean, in the last two years, we've tried addressing this offensive line. We drafted Evan Neal. We drafted John Michael Smith. And, you know, they have not, you know, especially Neil has not pound out, uh, panned out yet. You know, uh, and we think a lot of it is coaching. It's it, it's technique. I mean, how many times did we yell at the screen or at the stadium? It's like they're not picking up stunts. They're not picking up stunts. We don't have five guys who don't know how to pick up a stunt. We have five guys who have not been coached to mm-hmm. anticipate this is what these guys do. And then what do you do to prepare for it? We look like just an. We look like an uncoached offensive line who got sloppier in technique as the season went on. And then, of course, you know, you know, we got thin. You know, we basically played with, you know, missing two tackles for a big majority of the season. We played we, a guy who was on the couch. We had to go in and start. And I think I saw the stat. Grump, help me out here. But, like, um, what's his name? Played 95% of the snaps he was in. Since he came off the couch, just re- yeah. I mean, it was ridiculous how much we relied on a guy who wasn't even playing. I, I think so, that Justin Pugh is a very interesting case too, because I think it speaks to the root of the problem. Like, you know, y- you can you can look at things in question, and over the years, the, the offensive line has been either average at its best, and this year I think as a collective total is about as low as it gets and it's never been anything better than average for the last couple of years and and there's been fingers pointed at everything right like initially with Andrew Thomas's rookie year they had picked the wrong tackle that's what everybody thought I mean immediately upon drafting everybody has their own opinions but uh, you know he, he had a shaky couple of games in the beginning of the year you know I have people putting him on blast on Twitter breaking down game film and stuff like that I mean like people not like random people that have a Twitter account. I mean, people with credentials and know what they're talking about. Ripping him apart. I think Justin Pugh coming off the couch and being one of the most technically sound linemen that we had on the line speaks directly to the root of the problem. It's not talent. It's not scouting. It's not figuring out what the best talent is. And it's not acquiring. You know, it's not... a. These aren't the problems. We have, you know, identified good linemen. We have obtained them you know we put good value into that you know high 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 draft picks and they're not developing at the same rate as some worse players around the league just quite frankly so we know what the issue is we're not we're not making them better these these rookies coming in from college and you know uh if justin Pugh comes in with years of experience and you know at the end of his ability part of his career and that's better than a lot of what we had. That really speaks to the root of this issue. So, I, I mean, Bobby Johnson being out is half the problem uh, solved. The other half is now a, a finding a new offensive line coach, somebody who's going to develop some talent. they got to continue investing in that probably is the way I see it. It's interesting to me that you give a lot of credit to Mike Kafka. And I, 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 I think your, your reasoning is sound, but it is difficult to discern exactly how much input Mike Kafka has. There is a very, uh, I, I think, plausible theory that Brian Dable has kind of been calling a lot of the shots whenever things went off the rails. And I think most people point to the night and day difference in two halves in Arizona as, you know, did he just take play calling away? Like, what is Kafka's role? But but I think that 
giving credit to Shea Tierney for Tommy DeVito being a name that somebody outside of New Jersey has ever heard of is 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 a good I, I think that speaks to that. Like you can't be a, a quarterback coach that's terrible and that happen, I don't think. Right, because we we saw what Tommy DeVito was when he first came into the Jets game, and and you know the the just the development that we saw from that guy, a deer in headlights, you know, to even the next week. Not that he was good in Dallas by any means, but you saw that you know that next step, and then you saw a step, a step every week, really, you know, culminating in I think the the Green Bay game looking like an actual competent NFL quarterback, and I think he definitely deserves credit for that. I do, he, um, and he, and I think it's fair to question Kafka's input. That's fair. Yeah, he went from a quarterback who should not be on a field to someone who could potentially be a backup at some point. Someone that they can invest time in to see what they have in him. That's, and that's, a, you know, these are big steps. You know, we've seen college quarterbacks who looked really good. Hell, there's been Heisman Trophy candidates who have never played a down in the NFL. That's the difference between college and the NFL. And that's a difference between, you know, being a undrafted guy who just tries to make a roster to someone who's going to be a starter. So we, we, you weed out people that just don't belong in this league. And I think what we saw from Tommy DeVito said, well, we could still look at him. And I think that's an accomplishment. I agree. Because going into that, it's, I, I can't believe this guy is coming into a game. And now it's, if this guy's our third string quarterback next year, I feel okay about that. I, I, I definitely don't feel badly about that. Do you feel, so when we went from Tommy DeVito Back to um, Tyrod Taylor. Do you think the coaches handled that the right way? Do you think they should have stuck with Tommy DeVito the rest of the year, let him play? Do you think that as soon as Tyrod Taylor was available, he should have been back? Do you think? How do you think they handled that kind of quarterback flip flopping towards the end? It's funny because I talk, I keep talking about how well DeVito played in the Green Bay game, but I don't think DeVito should have played in that Green Bay game. I personally think that as soon as Tyrod was healthy and ready to play. Uh, that Tyrod should have been your starting quarterback. Tyrod is a better quarterback than Tommy DeVito. I don't think anyone, even Tommy DeVito's agent maybe, but could question that. Um, you know, Tyrod's got years of doing it. Tyrod's got years of film that are not terrible, where he's capable, he's functional. I think it's the, I, I thought it was the wrong thing to do to stick with DeVito. I understood why they did it. Uh, I think a lot of it was done, frankly, to appease the uh, fan base, which is not, a uh, great way to do things, um, but I, I definitely feel like the only fair thing to do to the players in the locker room who are going out there and and busting their butt every every week was to play who gave you the best chance to win. And I don't think that anyone could rationally argue that Devito gave you the best chance to win. To be fair to your defensive coordinator as well, too. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something that you know that the theory was. Well, they want to see what they have in Tommy Devito. Well, these coaches had more time to see him in person than they look at players in practice for the senior bowl or something in person to make a decision on whether they draft him or not. They got, you know, four or five full game tapes of him to make that. I mean, to me, it was like when they made the thing, that's it, you're done. Let's try to, let's try to win some games. Like again, we are as much in the culture building on this team as we are trying to win meaningless games in December for a season not winning the playoffs and look at the big picture. And, um, yeah, I, I saw all I needed to see. And, you know, I think they did the right thing going back to, to Taylor and staying with him. And I've been one of Taylor's biggest critics, um, uh, about just his mindset and how he plays the game and all this different stuff. But, um, you have to look bigger picture sometimes. And I agree completely with what you had said on, on the most recent podcast with him not playing the right way for a backup quarterback, that your job really in week 18 is to, to make it through that game. You know, I, I, I do agree with that. Yeah, arm guys, you got your freaking mind. Come yep. on. Yep. No, yeah. absolutely. And that, that was a common cranky, uh, screaming, uh, chant at, in the stands. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think anyone will ever tell you that, uh, like you said, Tommy DeVito's agent, maybe his dad and mom will tell you that he's a better quarterback than Tyrod Taylor. But, uh, I mean, he was coming back from four broken ribs, medically cleared, and actually in the, the best thing for that player may not be the same thing, which has always been my justification for playing Tommy DeVito in that game. You, you, if you truly want to move forward with Tyrod Taylor down the stretch – just because he's medically clear doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best thing. I still don't understand how he played with 
four broken ribs down the stretch. I got to be totally honest with you. Is this not surviving going to Starbucks and getting a coffee order with four broken ribs, which is already an accomplishment for me. This is getting hit by 300 pound men behind the Giants offensive line. And he makes no bones about running forward and getting hit by 300 pound men with forward momentum and legs being bent in weird directions. So it's just like, I don't know, it might have been a little bit of protecting players from themselves. You know, we, we do see that sometimes people are, uh, we wouldn't call them healthy scratches, but they were questionable going into games, which means that they are cleared medically usually, and they're still sit. Um, I, I, I justified it that way. That's that's the only way I can justify it, to be completely honest with you guys. Um, and, and again, unless, again, the Green Bay game was where they made that decision, right? Joe Barry really did make that game as easy as possible. And if they saw that going into it, they, you know, they're like, I, I think we really can win with Tommy against this defense. It's probably best to leave Tyrod there. I mean, I certainly didn't expect that going into it, but you know, I don't know. That was my justification. But I don't want to talk about third and second string quarterbacks for the rest of eternity here. I do want to flip to I, I think we could probably transition in and out of this one quickly. So uh uh, Ant is actually the captain of the Fire McGahee squad. It's been going for several years now. Um, he's been right every step of the way. Special teams, in my opinion, has never, ever, ever been an advantage, even though he had a Pro Bowl kicker. Um, I don't think that you'll have to convince anybody, but just talk a little bit about special teams this year and in general under McGahee. Just, it's like you said, it's never been an advantage. Uh, we've got one of the best kickers in football. Um, and it's it's never been an advantage. Uh, you see Jamie Gillen with a huge leg, and I just feel like there's no real development as far as his finesse kicking goes. Everything tends to be right down the middle when it's you know when it should be maybe going out of bounds at the ten yard line at the five yard line. I've, I don't think I've seen that once from Jamie Gillen. It's you hope for the best that you get a good bounce, but then our coverage teams are poor enough that nobody's ever there to down it at the five yard line like you see every single week with other teams. Um, we, we saw the blocked kick that really led to the downfall of the whole season. Um, we, we did finally see a punt return for a touchdown. McGay, he called that one a few weeks prior. He said, we're about to pop one in. And we did uh, fully on individual effort. That was all Gunnar Olszewski. Yeah. That was not, um, you know, a great block well, like we saw with the Bills the other night. <laughs> it's very simple to me with special teams. You don't have to have great special teams. They just can't be a liability. And the problem Absolutely. with this team was they were a liability. You mm -hmm. know, just... You know, penalties, uh, you know, missing critical kicks, block kicks, just, you know, poor special teams coverage. Uh, you name it. it you know, it, to have special teams be an advantage or a weapon would be a dream beyond my wildest imagination. I just don't want special teams to put a team that's struggling on offense, struggling on defense into a bigger hole than they should be. And that's been the problem with this team for far too long i know that i know that the the common thought the common chant is that special teams just can't be a liability and i agree with that obviously like nothing can be a liability you don't want anything to be a liability but you know we're starting from scratch now right you know we have specialists that we think we like um you know i guess it remains to be seen about both both of them are hurt um, but, you know, we think we have some specialists that we like here. We have no coordinator right now. It would be nice to, you know, if you're going to hire somebody, set the bar a little bit higher than don't be a liability. Like, it would be cool to just – I'm not I'm not saying we should have the top five special teams unit in the NFL. It would be nice to see some creativity. That would be cool. Be it, though. <laughs> I would like – I would like – strive to be one of the top five best in, in all sure. phases of the game. Absolutely, but I'm I'm saying like you know baby steps doesn't have to be just don't screw up just function I mean like something to try yeah. anything where it feels like if the other team special teams coordinator has to take time out of his prep to prep for us and our punt scheme or this potential fake that mm -hmm. we did or or that we did in preseason or or anything I don't know just something I mean you you see Dallas's special teams coordinator is a uh, former coaches it's uh, John Fossil right. In my in my opinion, a very good eye for obtaining talent. He's got himself a very good kicker and a very good punt returner on the cheap coming out of spring football, and they're two of the best special teams player in the NFL. And not only that, they just have a very good special teams unit. And I, I know that you know we've we talked about this before. Special teams often has to do with the talent you have on players number forty seven through fifty six or fifty seven fifty eight. 
But you can't tell me that Dallas is so far worlds away from us on a roster standpoint, but that's the reason why they just absolutely embarrass us in that phase of the game. It's not just that, you know? I think they, they prioritize it more than we do. They yeah. go out and they get a Cavante Turpin, and, and we, we stick with Gary Brightwell and Eric Gray, who, I mean, I don't know why those are the guys that you're going to put back there on kickoffs. Uh, I think you want somebody shifty fast on kickoffs, and I don't think you would really mistake either of those guys for being shifty or particularly fast. Um, I just don't think that we've made it a priority. I know they gave Gano a huge kicker contract, but that's just one piece of it. Sometimes people look at roster management as more important than actual results on the field. And it's like, well, this guy can also return punts and he can also do that. It's like, well, you know, somebody doesn't do either thing well. What good is it? Right. Just because he can do it doesn't mean he should be doing it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now, this is probably the um, largest turd in the sandwich. Um, and it's not – I don't think it has anything to do with the on-the-field play when I say that. But uh, the defense. Um Defense started to come alive down the stretch. You know they weren't they weren't bad at any point in this year. I, I would you know other than like I said that historic Cowboys game and that was a collective failure anyway. Um, we did get to see Kayvon hit some double digit sacks in a scheme that doesn't often result in outside linebacker sack stats. Um, Deontay Banks looked like he had a pretty good rookie year. I'm certainly happy with it. Um, the turnovers started to come late, but they didn't come like at all last year. Uh, so that was an improvement. Uh, now we got a now we got a DC that left the team on on quote unquote mutual terms. Can, give me give me some brain droppings on the defense. Um, before you know yesterday, I, I was all in on bringing Wink back. I think that overall the defense was was pretty good considering everything that they had to deal with this year with how poor the offense was, how poor the special teams was. Um, there were terrible games, like you mentioned, that, that Dallas game, 650 yards, 49 Miami points. Game that, was, that's embarrassing. Miami, Miami game, 500-something. So I, would, I, I would even I, say we, we mentioned that the 49ers game wasn't abysmal, but the one thing that was indisputably abysmal in that game was tackling. Was tackling. Oh, the, probably yeah. the main reason we lost. Yep, mm-hmm. tackling was terrible. And I think even the Vegas game, I think, was a very poor defensive effort considering everything that – that was happening in that game against, as you mentioned, Aiden O'Connell to give up 30 mm-hmm. points in that game. And I know it wasn't all on them, but that was just a very disappointing performance. So I think they had their their real disappointing performances throughout the year. But I think that there was definitely more good than there was bad. And that was why I was all on board with bringing Wink back, especially because you've kind of tailored the talent on this defense around his system, right? With, with banks being a real press man corner and just a lot of the talent that you got there kind of suited towards Wink's defense. I feel that you do kind of need to bring in maybe not a wink clone, but somebody who is going to prioritize pressure and prioritize, um, you know, some of the similar traits as to what wink did. Um, because you're starting over again, if not, you're starting (laughs) over again. Yep. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be pretty furious if Leslie Frazier even gets an interview. Oh. I gotta be honest. Um, I, I actually, interesting. You know, you were. I think you might have been a little bit more gutted about uh, the Wink situation, it, texting me out of the blue about it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I explained to you like I'm I'm bummed for multiple reasons about this. Like this is an embarrassing thing for starters. This is sixty and fifty year old men acting like high schoolers. Um, and for this wasn't a brief like one game emotional thing that you can be like ah it was in the heat of the moment it was like over the course of several months um, yeah so this this is like truly embarrassing I, I think it also sucks because it's a non football reason that you are now taking steps backwards there are certainly pieces that were brought here that are very scheme specific but I, I hope that that Wink wasn't brought in here under any other circumstances other than Brian Dable coveted his ability to run a defense without any input or help probably um, and and coveted that style of defense. In my opinion, the way the NFL has shaped the rules over the last two decades, it is impossible. You will you will not win unless you have if you if you sit back on defense and you play even the Patrick Graham style defense and we liked Patrick Graham, but this is like a four down league now. It doesn't matter if you stop them on third and seven and they get, you know, five yards. That's not four. You just get your ass back out on there. You're going to have to stop Did somebody from getting two yards. Did championship game Monday night? That game was won by Michigan because Panics had no time to throw. Well, yeah. They, they yeah. were constantly 
They didn't sack him a whole lot of times, but they were constantly taking him off his mark. He was constantly under duress. And, and, and I honestly think that's how – I think that's – I think that's how you have to do it in today's NFL. The way the rules are, you can't hit receivers. You can't even touch them half the time. I have no idea what's pass interference and what's not. I have no idea how a player playing at 100 miles an hour can know what to do. Um, it's just the way it works. you got to bring it to them. Don't let them run their game plan. Throw them off that. Let them have to worry about what you're doing and not about what they want to do. I think that's the only way to win now unless you've got an offense that can consistently score 40 points, which we are further from than we are the moon. Uh, so I, I really hope that this style of defense, not just for the personnel turnover and stuff, I honestly think it's the best way to win uh, in today's NFL. It's just the way the league has changed. Uh, that's just my personal thought on it. No, I, I agree with that, especially, as you mentioned, with having a, a bad offense, right? Because you're going to need to make stuff happen defensively. There are a number of games this year that really we were only in because they made stuff happen defensively. Um Frank, you, you mentioned the Miami game as being a very poor defensive effort. It was. It was terrible. They gave up 500-something yards. But the only reason that was even a game was because they had a 102-yard interception return for a touchdown. They had a couple, had a couple turnovers more turnovers. That's, that's you know, the great equalizer. You that's know, the great three, equalizer. Three plays can offset 40 plays in a game. And that mm-hmm. was an oppor- That was a situation where three plays kept us in a game we had no business being in. None. Mm-hmm. And, uh Yeah. I mean, you're not going to get three turnovers every game, but if you put yourself in a position where it's very possible and it's something they know coming in, hey, this team, you know, they strip the ball. They're in position. They, they they pick off passes. They're 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 the pressure they're putting on the quarterback is going to, you know, have balls in the air and stuff that can be easily picked. That's a huge. You have to have the mindset for something as much as the physical attributes, and I think, you know. Putting the fear of God in a team is halfway there, I think. I, I can't argue with that. You know, you, you've got them already having to think about something that they wouldn't have to think about otherwise. And, you know, just, just being able to force those turnovers, really, when especially when you have a bad offense, is is essential. And they, they got good at it at the end of the year. Um, um, a lot of it, sure, was, was luck, you know. Um, even that, that first Philly game, you know, they gave up 33 points. They didn't play particularly well, but another pick six, you could say it's lucky all you want with the receiver falling down and it going right into a Dory's hands, but he, he made the play, you know, he well, made goes. the play, he made it happen. And that was a one score game. Why again, mostly because the defense made the plays. Let me ask you a more of a big picture program, uh, question as we kind of move back from the, you know, overall state of the giants itself. Do you feel that this program, do you feel better about this, this team, this organization now after the season is over or before kickoff of the Cowboy game? That's a great question. Um, I felt really good before kickoff of the, that first Cowboys game. So I don't know that I could say that I feel better. And I think that so much of that has to do with the quarterback position, just having that uncertainty. Going into the Cowboys game, we had our quarterback. We just signed, you know, uh, our quarterback to a four year, 160, whatever million dollar it was contract. And even if you weren't a full Daniel Jones believer going into the season, you had your quarterback coming off of a good season, coming off a a wonderful playoff performance in in that Minnesota game. Really, I don't think even the biggest Danny Jones hater could deny that he was he was pretty outstanding in that game. Um, So I was feeling pretty great coming into the season. I, I, I don't know that I'm as high going into next season, but I'm not down in the dumps um, because I I still think that they have the right coach. I still think that they have the right GM. This whole wink thing sucks. And it, it, you know, it, it does put a little bit of a stain on Dable for me, but the more that keeps coming out throughout today, the more I feel good riddance to wink Martindale, to be perfectly honest with you. I feel that he's, Honestly, everything seems that he's been childish and he's really been trying to force the hand of, of getting himself fired, um, you know, which uh, that that's a Dable hire. So it's fair to question, you know, does he have the right eye for, you know, uh, his coordinators? But I, I don't think that I, Grump, you've said it on, on, on the podcast that there was not a football reason to move on from Wink Martindale. So I feel that Dable has the eye for the good football guys, at least. Well, here's the thing, too. You know, we had two coordinators. You said the, the eye for the right coordinators. Both of them interviewed for head coaching jobs last year. Kafka's going to interview again this year. 
I think he does. I, I, I know, again, this story, you know, again, we're going to hear different sides of the story. We're going to have different leaks from different camps to try to get the narrative out there first. So what really happened? Who knows? Mm-hmm. And, you know, is Dable the asshole? Is, is Wink the asshole? Are they just a, a collection of assholes? We don't know. <laughs> and the bottom line is he is no longer here. So, you know, that sucks. But again, let's go through every head coach in the last 20 years and see what his hit rate is on coordinators, position guys. You know, I don't see I don't see anything egregious with 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 with, um, his hires and stuff to say, wow, he's really bombed. I see guys that, you know, are kind of coveted by other teams. Mm -hmm. You know, Wink is going to get another job and probably very quickly. Oh, he yeah. might be a head coach somewhere. He might be a defensive coordinator somewhere. He didn't pick these guys. They're just like, you know, never to be seen in the NFL ever again. Mm-hmm. So um, I feel, and I, this may sound oversimplified, but so many things happened on this season that were beyond our control and were a bad aligning of the stars that is, this to me is a pause rather than a step back this year. I mean, that Dallas game, you play that game 40 times. We losing that game 40 nothing 40 times? No way. You know, I don't know if we're going to win a lot of those games. They're better than us, but I don't think, you know, the catastrophic way it looked and smelled, you know, the injuries were, you know, the most important people at the worst times. It's a snowball effect and it, you know, it's a butterfly effect of affecting other things too. Um, but I feel very confident still with Dable. I feel confident with Kafka. I am not quite as confident yet in Joe Shane. I mean, not that I want to get rid of him or anything, but I have a higher confidence in the coaching staff than him. Let's see another draft or two. Let's see, you know, what happens, you know, in the next two years of building this roster. Um, But I still think that we are on the right path. I don't think we are stuck in neutral. I don't think we've taken steps back that are long-term steps back. Um, I still have confidence in Daniel Jones, you know, assuming he gets healthy next year. I'm not in the, we have to get a new quarterback with the draft. I don't think we need to trade up to get a guy for, uh, to me, I, my stance has always been very consistent. If you have the opportunity to replace him at a cheaper cost, you get him. He's not that good, Daniel Jones, but there's no reason to replace him just to replace him at this point, especially with the money impact and everything. So I just think that, um, you know, it might come as simple as we just need some breaks and we've had so many breaks go against us and, you know, maybe we need some good karma. Thank and- you. I, I, I agree with you. It, it, this truly was not everything that could have possibly gone wrong season did go wrong. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to play the what it could have should a game, but we were a Darren Waller non-pass interference call, a Graham Gano missed 32 yard field goal and a missed two point conversion away from nine and eight. And I know that that's an oversimplification, but I think that speaks volumes about Dable. And I know that I just, you know, spoke a little bit negatively about maybe some of the coordinator stuff a little while ago, but this team never quit. This team never gave up on him and beating Philly. I know that we lost one spot in the draft position. We needed to beat Philly, man. We needed to beat Philly in a game that coming into that game did matter for them. That felt, amazing uh it's been i know it was just a few years ago that we beat them but it just felt like it's been so long since we, we beat said that, that team we said it on monday night show the exact same thing where uh you know that's the last game of the season too <laughs> so never mind you want to go into the off season just feeling a little bit better about yourself i know a lot of these guys on this team may not be here next year but you don't you won't have the graphic coming up you know in the game next year against philly they've lost x amount of times you know, you're not going to have that as, as a storyline in the offseason. You know, there's going to be enough negative things that are going to be said about this team in question marks going forward. We don't need any more of these things, you know. And again, fans, fans lock into different things that media does. And fans care about, did you beat your rivals? Did you win games when I go to the game and look like garbage? You know, so the last thing the fans see, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who... You know, we're the ones who pay for season tickets and we're the ones who, you know, spend 300 bucks for a jersey and, you know, all go to Fan Fest in May for no reason. It's that, you know, you want to just have just something. And, you know, that's part of building culture. And, you know, 
And do you, do you want to be a, a, a co-host on this podcast? Because I, I can't keep agreeing with Cranky this much. I, I'm actually surprised. I actually view this also as a pause in a in a weird way because <laughs> so much went wrong that it's not like you can't blame. It, it, it's almost just like, well, Jesus Christ, it started off so far behind. You know, it's just, what did you expect from me? It's almost You don't have an excuse, but you almost have an excuse. And... The interesting thing about that to me is that um, now time has passed and we got some answers, right? Like I think we got some answers on who Daniel Jones might be. I think we we definitely got some answers on who Wink Martindale is. I, I was never really afraid of if Kafka has to leave because I know that Kafka is developing as an offensive coordinator under the head coach who is not going anywhere until he needs to go somewhere. So I was more concerned about the day that Wink Martindale gets a head coaching job and then we're left high and dry. After this year being a total absolute wash, Wink Martindale, now I know that there is no, that relationship could not be sustained for another year. So he really, he really had a end date of like after three years whatever he said about this being a destination he was not going to stay here for more than the three years of his contract that wasn't going to happen and when this season went off the rails it was just flat out over so we got some answers in this season that was not a total it's not to me it's not a total loss anymore we have more uh, um, clarity into what we need to do in the off season I think I think there's a difference there's a difference grump between an excuse you know, excuse can explain things. Excuse is when you say, well, we weren't 13 and three because of this and this and this. But you can say injuries caused us to be five and 11 or something. There's a, there's, it's a nuance, but it's very true. I hate when people say you can't make excuses. Well, no, those are facts. <laughs> when you're stating facts, that is the truth. When you say, well, this team really is a playoff team, but this, 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 this didn't happen. That's excuses. And None of us are doing that, fortunately, and I don't think the coaches are either. And so I, I, I hate when people are like, oh, you're just making excuses. Like, nope, just, I'm telling you what happened. These things mm-hmm. actually happened. Daniel Jones got hurt. Andrew Thomas got hurt. You know, uh, we traded Leonard Williams in the middle of the season. Uh, you know, all these different things happened. These are facts. It's not a crutch. I don't want to do over. I'm not Florida State saying I should be in the championship regardless. <laughs> I am saying these are things that actually happened. And these are things that need to be said when you are making a decision on what is this team. I mean, these things impeded progress, impeded where we want to go. It doesn't – some of it may or may not change what I think. And a lot of these things don't change what I think going forward. And I, I would agree with that because I think if you were to just look at the roster from this year and the roster from last year, if you assume the same health that we had, that we were fortunate enough really to stay pretty healthy for all of last year, I think if you assume that same health this year, I think this roster beats last year's roster. And I think that that really is is definitely the case. And I think that that's why I agree with you entirely on it being a pause more so than a step back. The record might state that it's a step back, but I, I don't think that this team was any worse than last year's team. If anything, they were probably a little bit better playing a tougher schedule and got rocked with injuries and right being, from the get go. And being in a year two of the Kafka offense and the wink defense, big, big jumps from week year one to year two, those things, we never really got to take advantage of that because mm-hmm. of, you know, injuries and personnel issues and circumstance and everything. That's a great point too. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think it speaks to the fact that they made the right improvements over the offseason. It just, you know, it wasn't enough to overcome the, you know, the extra things that came with this year—a harder schedule and the injuries that happened when they happened. But I mean, right with three roster upgrades with Deontay Banks, Bobby Okereke, and I would say adding an A. Sean Robinson, just some some bodies to that defensive line rotation. That defense beats the Christ out of last year's defense. It's not close. We're talking about Fabian Moreau here. We're talking about, you know what I mean? Like Micah McFadden is the lead dog middle linebacker. Um, We have a totally different guy calling the plays. Xavier McKinney is calling the plays in last year's defense, which I don't think is really what Wink prefers. I think he really priority. He's a linebacker's coach by trade. I think his defense, you know, uh, deprioritizes outside linebackers and it allows linebackers to play more free. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I agree with you guys. So, um, 
let me hit you with this question before we go to the uh, playoff predictions because I want to talk a little bit of wild card really quickly. But going into this year, in your opinion, what is the most important area of improvement for this offseason? If you had to pick one, like the one thing that they cannot let – and obviously they have to fill coaching vacancies, right? But, I mean, is does it have to be a specific coach? Is this the one thing they have to get right? Is it is it this position needs to be upgraded? That's got to get right. Just want to know what your thought is if you had to just – this is the thing they cannot screw up this offseason. It's the easy answer, but I think it's the right answer. And I think it's the offensive line. And I think that the coach is a big part of that. But I think that it's also the talent on the line. I I refuse to believe that Evan Neal forgot how to play football. I'm not saying that he's ever going to turn into a stud right tackle. But I refuse to believe that with good coaching, he's going to be this bad. I, I, I just I, I watched the guy play at Alabama against good competition, you know, pretty much week in and week out and be a shutdown right tackle. I, I think that with the right coaching, he's going to be a good player. I think personally, you need to go and get solid veterans on the line. You've got Thomas. We know what we have in Thomas. He's an excellent left tackle. I think that Schmitz is going to hopefully take a big jump. Center's a really, really tough position to play as a rookie, and you know I expect to see a jump from him again with better coaching. I think that getting vets on the interior, because it's easy to keep throwing draft capital at it, but at some point you need just a, a good, solid veteran in there, better than a Justin Pugh right off the couch. And credit to Justin Pugh. I mean, to come in and do what he did you know, after – legitimately coming in, not even on a roster or practice squad or anything. I think he did about as well as you could reasonably have expected from him. But you need better than that. You need a guy who's been there, done that, and who played all of last season and who has a full training camp in preseason. I think that you need to get a, a go and get a good veteran interior offensive lineman. And I think that that's the, the building block. I think everything starts to fall into place from there. Obviously, there are talent upgrades that are needed across the board. Like I said, I love Darius Slayton to, to death, but he can't be your wide receiver one going into next year. Um, but I really do truly think that it all starts with that offensive line coach being able to actually develop what you've got and then going in and getting good, solid veterans to fill out the rest of the interior of that line. You, you can't be halfway pregnant and you can't halfway fix an offensive line. You can't say... Well, you know, this year we're going to draft our center and then we'll move on. I mean, a commitment has to be it's we're going back to Eli Manning was not given an offensive line at the latter half of his career, which seems like 47,000 years ago now. <laughs> and now we're going into year 3 of the third coach since he was around. This has to be addressed and has to be addressed holistically and it has to be addressed with depth as well as even starters too because again our big concern before the season started was tackle depth and we got tested very quickly and we failed the test you know you throw what you have to throw at it whether it is draft capital whether it is free agent money whether it's a trade around the margins to get someone we need bodies we need talent we need depth and i don't care you know every other every other conversation's moot you know, we could talk until we're blue in the face about re-signing Saquon Barkley. Saquon Barkley sucked this year, relatively speaking, because he had nowhere to run. Bottom line. You know, we could talk all we want about getting Marvin Harrison Jr. or, you know, Brock Bowers or any of these guys. It doesn't matter if these guys can't run their routes. And we have a quarterback who's constantly running for his life or, you know, doesn't have time to, to, to get his, his reads in. So, we just have to address it. It has to be priority one. And, you know, oh, if we miss out on a potential wide receiver one this year, this it's not Super Bowl or bust next year. I think that, you know, out of all of this, Brian Dable, I guess you could say he won the kind of battle with him and Wink. He's got power in this building now. And he's not on any hot seat at all. He should feel empowered. You know, and and Joe Shane as well to get the guys they want. It doesn't have to be done all at once. No shortcuts. We're doing do it the right way. I agree with you that we need experience on offensive line, but I don't want quick fixes either. Right. You know, it has to be something where you know it's we're not circling twenty twenty four as the Super Bowl year. So they have to be smart. They have to be experienced, but smart guys who still have 
you know, gas in the tank who can go more than one year or just we're signing these guys to a one year deal to get us through this season. We have to, it has to be sustainable. So that's their big challenge. And until we fully address it, we'll have a really good left tackle we'll have a pretty good center and we'll have, you know, a, you know, a, a cast of excuses. Of the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no need to repeat. Uh, all three of us are on the same page. So I want to fire around thoughts for Wild Card Weekend here. There, are, I, I think that these matchups are going to be pretty easy to predict. But there's two that I think are really, really interesting. But I'm, uh, I don't know if they're going to be the same ones that you guys think. So we'll go around. We'll go Ant, Crank, me. Browns at Tanksons. What are your thoughts? I think it's a great matchup. I'm, I'm very interested. And I'm surprised that um, Cleveland are road favorites um i think that overall they're the better team but i just feel like cj stroud wins a playoff game in his rookie season i like how they're playing i think their defense has been solid of late and i think the texans win a close game this is going to be cj stroud's with how many games has he played this year now this is going to be his 17th I think so. That's a lot for that's a lot for a rookie making that jump from college to the NFL. Um, he's a rookie, and I I know there's been a rotating cast of characters with Cleveland for quarterbacks, but I think Cleveland's going to roll personally. I think Houston's overachieved this year. You know, God bless him, good coach. D'Amico Ryan's that I heard today might be a uh, possible candidate for the Bama job. Actually, he's got ties uh-huh. to Bama. I mean, a year like this kind of makes you attractive, but I think Cleveland's going to roll, personally. I don't know about roll. This is one of the ones I think is one of the more interesting games of the weekend. It's I am I could see Texans winning this game, I think, mainly because are we still rolling Joe Flacco out there? Mm-hmm. I, I think that this becomes more of a coach's battle. You've got a rookie quarterback and an uh, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge for a quarterback. And, you know... Uh, it comes down to like which coach is better prepared, and I think that you know Houston. I don't think they've. I, I guess they've kind of overachieved, but I think this the success they've had was un- without Tank Dell is unsustainable. Like there, there is a finite. There is an ending point for them this season that is not the Super Bowl, um, regardless of coaching. I think, uh, but huge turnaround for that organization with with you know minimal moves there. Uh, I could see Houston winning this game. But I'm gonna go Cleveland. I think it's. I think this is gonna be one of the more exciting games of the weekend. Dolphins at Chiefs. I don't think this one's gonna be too interesting. Ant, what are your thoughts? I think the Chiefs win at home, and I think they do it relatively comfortably. I think we've seen Miami beat up on bad teams all season long, and then whenever they've kind of gotten punched in the face back, they've folded. Um, I think that the Chiefs win. Probably by two scores. Um, I think I saw the over under set at like 42 for that. I do think it goes over. I know that the Chiefs offense has definitely not been nearly as explosive this year, but I am not a believer in this Miami defense at all. I think the Chiefs win by probably 10 to 12 points. There's no other quarterback I want in the playoffs than Patrick Mahomes. I don't care if he's throwing to, you know, the uh, the straw man from Wizard of Oz. I still, (laughs) I still. I'll trust the guy who's been there and won it and who's still a top two, top three quarterback in this league. So I'll, I'll take them as well. Uh, Miami's banged up. This game's going to be cold as hell. Um, and I don't think – I know Kansas City has looked the way they've looked. I don't think they look that way in a wild card game under Andy Reid. I just don't see them coming in so unprepared that a busted up Miami team can beat them at home. I, I would be very shocked. Steelers at Bills. This is another one I, I don't think is going to be too interesting, but it, it is kind of interesting only because of uh, who's going to be available and who won't be. So, Ant, thoughts? I think the Steelers keep it close for, for a half, maybe even three quarters because their defense is, is solid and Josh Allen likes to turn the ball over now that Brian Dable's gone. I just don't think that they can score. Um I'd be surprised if they score more than 10 points in this game. Uh, the Bills defense is still, it's really clicking. It's its come around of late. And I think in the end, the Bills win, again, probably by two scores. Hey, one thing I wanted to bring up, I forgot to during that Kansas City-Miami discussion, is uh, it's going to be like zero degrees. And a team from South Florida playing in zero degrees. Mm-hmm. Um 
Buffalo. <laughs> you know, we, we, we saw with our own eyes the bad Buffalo. We've seen the good Buffalo. Games in Buffalo. I'm going to take another. I'm going to take another. Uh, another dog. I'm going to take Pittsburgh. I, I, I just well coached teams that play good defense in in bad weather. I like. I'm going to take up Pittsburgh. Shout out to Mike Tomlin. I mean, he's an incredible coach. I mean, to go ten and seven with that revolving door quarterback Mason Rudolph. I I can't argue that. I just don't see how they score in this game. I, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, T.J. Watt's not going to play. <laughs> Uh, so I, I I know Buffalo is supremely busted up. I don't know who's going to be active or not. I know that they've lost guys very early in the year to season-ending injuries. I think Rasul Douglas even went down uh, in the last game. Gabe Davis went down in the last game, all before halftime, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so, But I think T.J. Watt individually means more to Pittsburgh's success than those little pieces, and I, I agree. I think Buffalo is clicking right now, uh, but, you know, George Pickens is out of his mind, and Mike Tomlin is about as steady as it gets. I would even say within the last five years, probably more steady than uh, Bill Belichick. It's um, so insane, Grump. I, I've been alive 51 years, and the Steelers have had three coaches. It's nuts. Wow. Um, <laughs> Are you saying wow because I'm 51 years? Or? No, no. That That's just a crazy stat. Three coaches um, in 51 years is insane. Uh, I'd ask you how many Alabama coaches there's been, but I don't want to go down that road with you either. Uh, Packers at Cowboys. I, I and thoughts. This is a. This is a. I personally, I, I don't like either of these teams whatsoever. So I, I hope that they all fall over. But thoughts. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you there. Um, I hate the Cowboys far more than I hate the Packers. Um, I think that the Packers, if they can turn this into a shootout, they have a chance. But I think that Dallas is just too talented all around. Um, I think they end up dropping 35, 38 points in this game. And then I think it gets significantly tougher from here on out for them. But I think they win this game. I had the bold prediction before the season started the Cowboys wouldn't make the playoffs. What I meant to say is the Cowboys would not make the second round of the playoffs. They are going to lose at home, and Mike McCarthy will get fired next week. God, I hope you're bold, right. Bold, bold predictions. Um, I don't believe in Jordan Love. Uh, I think LaFleur is a, is a good coach. I never believed in Jordan Love. I never saw it with him. Um, clearly, there's some arm talent. I, I know that analysts are, are praising his improvements this year. I think if comparatively around the NFL – we weren't like, well, he put up these numbers, and that's the best this week. It, you know, if, if half the NFL, one third, I think, of the NFL at one point was playing backup quarterbacks all at the same time. Uh, had that not been the case, I think he would have been uh, page seven news of NFL Network. And quite frankly, statistically, the best team in the NFL this year was Dallas at home. Dallas wins. Um, this, to me, is the... Second most interesting, it might even be the most interesting game of the weekend. Rams at Lions. I don't even know where to begin. Ant. I love this game. I love Matthew Stafford going back into Detroit and trying to end their, you know, best season in a very long time. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I hate Jared Goff. I I think that Jared Goff is a bad quarterback. I think that Jared Goff is a bad quarterback in a system designed to make him look good. I think the Lions are a more explosive, more talented team. And I think that Matthew Stafford goes in and wins this game by multiple scores over Jared Goff and the Detroit Lions. Frankie wife wasn't asleep. She'd come out of her cave right now and beat you down for the Jared Goff <laughs> slander. But uh, I, in everybody knows that I hate Matthew Stafford. It doesn't matter what I hate. It's who's better. I think Detroit's going to roll. Roll. This is such a cool game. I, I, I love everything it, about this. I love I love that these two quarterbacks traded not that long ago, and they both had success. I think we've been waiting for this, literally. If if this could have been a Super Bowl, I think we'd watch it and be happy. Um, <laughs> I, I'm being serious. Like If it were possible, I would, I would watch a Rams-Lions Super Bowl. That's fun. Saturday, my favorite – one of my favorite things in this universe is Saturday night – or Saturday NFL football. And to have this as your Saturday night game, reminder everybody, 
Peacock. If you don't know that, <laughs> if you weren't, <laughs> but I, I, I think it's a, it's just what I want to see on a Saturday night. Um, you know, they're going to be fired up at Ford Field. Um, I'm all for it. I, I just think they're going to roll. I just uh, well, well, here's the thing. Have... You, you got, in my opinion, you have two good coaches. I, I, I do. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm surprised when Dan Campbell came in in his first press conference. I was like, what on earth? Another one um, of these guys. Yeah, uh, but my God, uh, and, and you know, maybe it's all the offensive coordinator. I, I have no idea. But you know, Sean McVay's no slouch either. And yet, the Rams very nearly didn't make the playoffs because they almost lost to us. That is a fact, right? Mm-hmm. They had not clinched anything at that point, right? Nope. Nope. Yeah, so, I mean, when I look at this, you know, I, I agree with Ant. Um, I, I think Matthew Stafford is by far and away a better quarterback than Jared Goff. Uh, I think coaching-wise, it's it's difficult to draw. I have, I have no idea. I'm going Rams because that's what I wrote down. But I think if you really wanted to, you could turn my, my mind in a couple of sentences. How many, I th- how many times have number one overall picks met each other in the playoffs? After also being traded with each other, that's got to be zero. Well, that's got to be that's got to be a, an only time. But I mean, just number one overalls altogether. I mean, I'm sure Peyton, you know, faced some guys, you know, throughout you know his time. But yeah, this seems like a pretty rare thing where you have guys that are drafted with high expectation and then the playoffs are, you know, doing their thing. So I think it's that's kind of an interesting little angle. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is probably I don't even know what to think of this game. Eagles at Bucks. Go Ant. Unfortunately, I think that the Eagles drew the worst team to make the playoffs out of the NFC this season, and that's the only reason that I think they win this game. I think that if they legitimately were playing any other team that made the playoffs out of the NFC this year, I, I don't I think they would get bounced in the first round. I, I like the Baker Mayfield comeback story. I think it's been fun. I think he's played very well, all things considered. And I think that we've seen in the last few weeks the league kind of figure them out. Um, it took a 9 nothing squeaking by of Carolina for them to, to clinch the division, make the playoffs. I don't believe in them. I think their defense got better as the season went on. But I just think that Philly, with all their faults and all of their injuries, is still so much better and unfortunately i hate picking them i hate them so much and nothing i would love nothing more than to watch sirianni lose in the first round i don't think it's happening you guys see this that no. is my that's that's my phone and that's my caesar's app i made one bet for this weekend and i took the bucks money line getting a plus 125 I've seen this Eagle team for the last month. I saw it very up close and personal this past Sunday. That team stinks. And I understand all the limitations with Tampa Bay. I understand that Baker's banged up. I understand all of that. But it is very, very hard in this league to flip a switch after a month with all the injuries and just all the whatever's going on that's causing this funk to all of a sudden turn it on against anybody, much less another playoff team. And I know we can bag on the bucks for, you know, being in a weak division and, and, and all and sort of backing into the, the playoffs by going forward makes sense, but that's kind of what they did. But I don't know. I, I am, I think if it wasn't the Eagles, if that wasn't the uniforms they're wearing, I think no one would think that that team would win going into Tampa Bay, no matter how bad Tampa Bay is. I think the Bucks win. I'm gonna I'm gonna win my bet, and that's that. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull for the Bucks for your bet. Um, I don't really care uh, about Tampa Bay. Uh, I, the Baker Mayfield story may be fun. That nine to nothing game was a snoozer, uh, and, and yeah. against the worst team in the league, probably um, without a head coach. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so. Um, I'm going Eagles, but the, there's. I would be shocked if they win next week. Uh, really, yes. they they looked garbagey against us. Sinbad's got a broken finger. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't. I, I just don't see it. There's even there are rumors, and I I don't know. Cranky, was it you and me? Where I was like, I'm not saying this. Other people are saying. It. Was that my boss with Nick Zeriani potentially being on the outs? Yeah, there's been a couple of things. I saw some things today. Also, um, would that be crazy if? Uh... The only NFC East coach standing after next week is, is Dable. It's Dable. Dable. 
Josina Anderson was right. That was unexpected. <laughs> then, you know, something a lot more reason. I might actually follow her if uh, Sirianni gets canned. Well, the cool thing is that no matter what happens, Josina Anderson was right because when you're that vague, anything is right. I start to sound right after a while. <laughs> uh, and I cannot thank you enough for coming on here. I hope that uh, you come on again. Uh, I am not going to wait until uh, – next summer or whatever this upcoming summer to to see you uh there is a devil's lightning game coming up in fry uh in february that maybe all three of us can attend would be kind Let's of fun bolts. um so i i i super appreciate you joining uh, the show i i'm happy to just have you because you're a smart dude people should listen to you talk from time to time about football you know what i mean so it makes thank games you. going fun. You know, we got our group to the right of us, we got you to the left of us. You know, it, it, it makes going to a game not just watching a game, but actually really having fun with our little community. So it's it's always great. It, it's awesome. I love it. And uh you guys are as passionate as I am. And you know I, I always uh complain about the crowd being one of the qu- quietest crowds in football drives me nuts. Not so me. It's I'm not loud. You. Oh, God, we'll do no, a ten hour you. episode about crowds and, and uh behavior <laughs> in, in a later that's a midsummer episode, but we will definitely discuss that. Fun if you fact want to me, complain for ten hours, have me on for that. Yep. <laughs> Fun fact, Ant tried to do what I do on a like down in down out basis and turned to me and goes how do you do this all game and that is slam my hands on a seat in front of me i will not say all game i will do it on defense after 20 Depressing. seconds i thought i had a broken hand <laughs> <laughs> then the big eagle fan B- big mo whatever his name is turn around and give you a stink eye like you better stop and then <laughs> all hell broke loose uh thanks so much for joining us man you're the you're the best guys thanks Anything so much to plug? for having me Oh, nothing really. Uh, at Ant Larger on Twitter, if you want to just see me tweet, hashtag Fire Thomas McGahey. I won't be doing that anymore now that Fire <laughs> Thomas McGahey has finally worked. That's really it, man. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. All right, man. Thanks for joining.